Hello everyone, this is Joseph Holbrook. We're going to uh, go over Protestant immigration into Latin America. This is our course, Religion in Latin America. And uh, this is chapter seven of Justo Gonzalez's book, Christianity in Latin America. And so let's jump, jump right in. Um, so, uh, the colonization of Latin America coincided with the period of the Protestant Reformation. Um, and so this was massive changes going on in Europe, in uh, the religious area of, in Europe between Catholicism and a new emerging form of Christianity called Protestantism. Hernan Cortez, by the way, the conqueror of Mexico, uh, lived during roughly the same time as Martin Luther, who was the father of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, so the Catholic Church lost huge amounts of territory and adherence in Europe to the Protestants. They also initiated uh, almost 100 years of warfare off and on in Germany and other places over religious issues. Um, at the same time in Mexico, the first printing press was adapted in 1537, and uh, a, a writing called Doctrina Cristiana was written by a Catholic, uh, but it was so similar to many of the points of the Protestant is, of Protestantism that he was held in prison by the Spanish Inquisition under the suspicion of being a Lutheran. Some of the antecedents of uh, Protestant Protestant immigration to Latin America included the presence of Germans in Venezuela. These Germans were, uh, many of them were Pro uh, Protestant Lutherans. Prince Barth Bartholomeo Welser was a banker who uh, had loaned a good deal of money to um, Emperor Charles V who then gave him permission to do business in Venezuela. Also, uh, French Huguenots arrived in Br Brazil in 1555. Huguenots were uh, French Protestants. They were in the minority. They were persecuted by the majority Catholics. Uh, they tended to be Calvinist, following the teachings of John Calvin. And because of the persecution, French Huguenots uh, left France in large numbers and spread out to places like Rio de Janeiro, where they attempted to found a colony, St. Augustine in Florida, where they founded another colony, and some of them turned to piracy. Um, this is a picture of the German uh, Welser, the banker. Uh, in 1588, the Spanish Armada was defeated and destroyed around England, which weakened Spain and began the process, slowed the process of Spain's decline. England was an ascendant imperial power uh, and also was Protestant, was uh, the Church of England or Anglican Church. The uh, British settled in Belize off the coast of Guatemala in 1638. They, uh, under Oliver Cromwell, the, the uh, British Navy uh, conquered Jamaica in 1655, and Jamaica passed from being a Spanish-speaking territory to being a English-speaking. Uh, the Dutch were also uh, trying to develop their empire. They had a widespread empire all the way through uh, India, Asia, China, and uh, they tried to penetrate the Spanish empire, and they settled in islands such as Curaçao, Aruba, Suriname, and eventually they uh, took a large chunk of northeastern Brazil that was the sugar producing area and uh, ruled it for 60 years and took the sugar production to another level of technical proficiency. The Dutch were also responsible for greater levels of religious tolerance. So a lot of Portuguese Jews who had, many of whom had fled from Spain in 1492 to Portugal a lot of these Portuguese Jews who had ended up in Brazil gravitated to the Dutch territories in northeastern Brazil where they could worship 
their Jewish faith, faith freely with no hindrance or persecution. There were also French buccaneers in Haiti. This is uh, the, the Bay of Guana, Guan, Guanabara, uh, where modern day Rio de, de Janeiro is situated. And there was a, uh, a settlement of French Huguenots there, uh, in actually before Rio de Janeiro existed. They were eventually uh, attacked and dislodged by a combination of Portuguese, Brazilian, and uh, mixed uh, indigenous troops. This is a picture of the Spanish Armada. And this is a picture of Curaçao. I believe it's uh, Welthestad, uh, Curaçao. Uh, there's a good book by, um, hold on one second, by Chris Lane about piracy in the Caribbean called Pillaging the Empire. It covers the period from 1500 to 1750. And one of the interesting things is uh, that's little known about piracy in the Caribbean. We think of Johnny Depp and... Uh, uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean. However, a, a little known fact is that many of the pirates were Protestants. The English, of course, were Protestant Anglicans. Uh, many of the French were Huguenot, Huguenot Protestants. And the Dutch were uh, uh, also Protestants. They were Calvinists. And so uh, they felt because they were in opposition to Catholicism, Roman Catholics in Spain, they felt justified in attacking Catholic shipping and taking all the gold and silver they could because they were fighting God's enemies. Of course, the Catholics, Spanish Catholics, felt the same way when they were fighting the uh, English, French, and Dutch pirates. They were fighting their their perspective of God's enemies. So, some new political and economic factors in Latin America in this time period. This includes uh, the rise of conservative and liberal parties in most of the 20-some uh, new nations that emerged from the Spanish Empire. The conservatives mostly represented the interests of landed uh, elites whose wealth was based on agriculture and cheap labor. They were pro-Hispanic pro-Catholic, pro-military, and pro-monarchy. Liberals came from mostly the new and growing merchant class. They were pro-separation of church and state. They were in favor of free markets and laissez-faire. And they were uh, looking to modernize their countries. And they admired, uh, they, they admired France, England, and the United States. And so, uh, usually not all of them, but one or the other, as opposed to Spain. And so they were very open to Protestant immigration. And in fact, they actively recruited Protestants to come to Latin America, South America, to uh, develop schools and improve education. Many liberals felt that the Catholic-run schools were perpetuating superstition and holding back their countries from modernizations. The first Protestant immigrants came from England, uh, which was Anglican. Uh, one example is Brazil, which entered into an agreement with Great Britain to allow freedom of worship to British subjects in Brazil. Pedro II became emperor of Brazil in 1840. Uh, he, was, uh, he, he was by spirit liberal, and he liberalized freedom of religion in Brazil and tolerated uh, Anglican and other Protestant forms of worship for foreign nationals living in Brazil. British traders were also allowed to open English-speaking Anglican chapels in Argentina, Chile, and Peru. Um, America Latin, La Marique Latin. Um, the French were also actively competing with the uh, English for influence in Latin America. Uh, 
and many French writers began using the term Amer la Amérique Latine, which led to our modern day Latin America. And there were French Huguenots who were Calvinist Protestants in France. And because they were fleeing persecution, many fled to the Americas. And I've already mentioned uh, their, their uh, um, settlements in Rio de Janeiro, St. Augustine, and there were buccaneers in Haiti. This is a picture of a French Huguenot in this, this period of uh, diaspora. These are some buccaneers. The, uh, these, the forked sticks that are holding up the meat that's roasting over the, over the fire in French was called a boucan. And from that term, Bukan, they became known as buccaneers. And they uh, they developed a small settlements <clears throat> on the coast of Haiti. And this eventually was the wedge that led to uh, Spain ceding to France a portion of Hispaniola, which they uh, called, um, oh man, I just forgot, not the Dominican. Uh, they called it, uh, I can't remember at the moment. But later, after the French, the Haitian Revolution, the Haitians renamed their, their portion of the island Haiti, which was after an indigenous name. Waldens, Waldensians were a Protestant. They weren't exactly Protestant. They were a Protestant-like group in Europe. They had started in the 12th century, which is a good three centuries before the Protestant Reformation. But they developed under the leadership of their, their leader, Peter Waldo, and his poor ones of Lyon. They uh, developed a lot of Protestant beliefs and Protestant doctrine and refused to obey the, the Pope and the Vatican. And so they were Protestants before there were Protestants. They started in, uh, in the 12th century, and in the 1840s, because of persecution in Europe, they began a slow process of immigration. As young people sought agricultural work, a lot of them were uh, situated around Switzerland, and began, and they ran out of land as they grew large families and their children needed land to farm. And so their young people began immigrating to other parts of uh, Europe, to Russia, and eventually they began immigrating to Uruguay. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, there were almost 4,000 Waldensians living in Uruguay and small uh, rural communities. They promoted the founding of schools. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, there were 10. In 1888, the Waldensians founded a junior college which is the first such school in the rural areas and the first to admit both men and women. In Europe, they were conservative, but in Uruguay, they became innovative. Also, there was a large influx of German-speaking Mennonites, uh, particularly the Paraguay. Mennonites were products of the Protestant Reformation. Um, they followed a man by the name of uh, Menno Siemens, and uh, they eventually became pacifists. And so because they were pacifists and because they didn't believe in serving in militaries and uh, they didn't believe in saluting the flag, they were suspect and sometimes persecuted because it was believed that they were not loyal to their home countries. So a lot of Mennonites under persecution began to immigrate to Russia. Uh, some begin to, a large group immigrated to Canada but when the First World War broke out, uh, Canada refused to grant them an exception and forced them to serve in the uh, Canadian Armed Forces in World War I. And so the Mennonites began leaving Canada, and uh, some moved to Mexico, and others moved to uh, Bolivia and Argentina. Also, after the Civil War in North America, there were a large number of North Americans that began to immigrate to South America, specifically over the issue of slavery. Some were black and some were white slave owners. The first to leave after the Civil War were African Americans seeking refuge in Haiti. Uh, 
and the Dominican Republic. In the DR, most of the African Americans formed Methodist groups who began missionary work among the Dominicans. James Theodore Hawley immigrated to Haiti after the Civil War with 109 other African American Methodists. In 1866, after the Civil War, Southerners began to move to Brazil because slavery was still legal in Brazil, and they hoped to continue their way of life. These include Methodists, Presbyterians, and Baptists. This is James, James Theodore Hawley, the uh, first bishop of the African Methodist Church. And then there were Mennonites in Paraguay. And here's a picture of some Mennonites on their carts. Uh, you can see images like this, similar to this, if you go to Ohio or Pennsylvania. Uh, the, the Mennonites were severely persecuted after the Protestant Reformation uh, in the Thirty Years' War because they refused to take sides, national sides, and they were pacifists. And so because of this intense persecution, they left Europe and migrated to other parts of the world. There were Mennonite colonies in Mexico, Bolivia, Argentina, and Belize, but above all in Paraguay. Their immigration began in 1926, first from Canada and then from Russia, in a, in a massive exodus to Paraguay. And then in 1928, a war broke out between Paraguay and Bolivia. But Paraguay kept its promise of respecting the pacifism of the Mennonites and allowed them to stay on the sidelines and did not force them to serve in the war. Uh, violence continued into 1935 with over 100,000 soldiers uh, fighting. Uh, and uh, I think 100,000 soldiers died in Paraguay. As the fighting got close to the Mennonite settlements, the Mennonites sent out medical teams and rescued uh, soldiers, wounded soldiers from both sides of the conflict and won the respect of pretty much everyone. In the midst and the aftermath of the Chaco War, the Mennonites began establishing schools, clinics, centers for treatment of leprosy, and agricultural schools, which attracted the Guarani Indians, some of whom were still uh, nomadic in the uh, jungles. They began to move near the Mennonite settlements for the medical care and also for the educational opportunities. And as of today, 8,500 Guaranis have been baptized into Menon the Mennonite community. I want you to think about something here. In your first essay, you wrote about the Jesuits and their attempts to uh, convert Guarani Indians to the faith. You saw that in the mission. This is a different model of influence, shall we call it spiritual influence, in which through acts of charity and good deeds and service, by get, providing medical care and educational care without any attempt to coerce or any attempt to even persuade, people end up adapting or adopting to uh, Christian beliefs. And this is what happened with these Guarani and Paraguay through the influence of the Mennonite community in their schools and their medical care. So in your last essay, it'd be interesting to write a comparison of the Mennonite form of missional work compared to the Jesuit. Here's one of the Mennonite schools with uh, Guarani uh, indigenous people in the school getting training. And uh, here's a picture about the Mennonites of Paraguay. Conclusion. The primary origins of Protestantism in Latin America was immigration from the Protestant nations. This was encouraged by the liberal parties in Latin America. The liberals and conservatives were at a, in the civil wars, numerous civil wars, throughout the 19th century. But eventually the liberal parties became dominant in most countries and encouraged Protestants and European Protestants in particular to move to Latin America to bring educational schools, to bring uh, technology, to bring uh, work ethic. Uh, some of it might be accused of being a bit racist in terms of the preference for European immigrants. Uh, 
Uh, one of the ironies is that many of the free churches, such as the Mennonites in Paraguay, free churches were churches in Europe which did not have an association with a state or with a na nation. For example, in England, you have you have the Anglicans, which is the Church of England, and they're the official church in England. But Methodists and Baptists in England also exist, and they're perhaps more numerous than Anglicans, but they're free churches in the sense that they're not in any kind of association with the national, nation state. So these free churches in Europe, such as the Mennonites, uh, because of their growth and their influence and their significance, were forced to take on some of the characteristics of the state churches, that, uh, like the Anglicans in England. And that's all we have for Protestant immigration. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.